The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to our service. Would you like to take a seat for a moment? For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Chris. I'm the new rector here. I'm not sure how long I can say I'm the new rector. I'm not sure how long new lasts for, but I definitely feel new at the moment. Before we do begin our service of worship properly today, there are just a quick couple of things we need to go through. We have been struck by COVID. So a number of us tested positive with COVID this week. Some people are not with us today, either because they've tested positive or because they want to make sure they avoid it. Um, I tested positive on Wednesday, but have now tested negative. So praise God, but I am now clear. Um, it means that we've just put a couple of things in place today to try and stop any spread and make sure today is a bit of a strange service so we can be normal practice next week. We're keeping all of the doors open to make sure we've got fresh air circulating. Uh, you'll notice that anyone who's at the front is wearing a mask. We won't be doing coffee after the service and we've made sure that we've minimised the number of people setting up the altar or the equipment so that we've reduced any chance of spreading any germs. Uh, we will also only be sharing communion in one kind today. So we will distribute wafers, uh, the bread, at communion, but we won't share the chalice, again, just to avoid spreading any infection. We'll be back to normal next week, we'll use the chalice next week, um, and if you receive the wafer, you have fully communicated. You don't only get half of Jesus in the bread and half in the wine, you don't need both to make a whole. You are fully communicated, you are fully connected with God if you receive the wafer at communion. I think that was all of the COVID notices. I think so. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and as I say, next week we will be back to normal. Let's stand for our opening song. Uh, I invite you to stand if able.
together in our prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you like to stand of Abel for the Gloria? Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, and we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We say together, Gracious Father, revive your church in our day, and make her holy, strong, and faithful, for your glory's sake, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you like to take a seat for our first reading from Scripture? The Old Testament reading is taken from 2 Samuel, chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having had her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. 
David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah did not go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines, where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. This is the word of the Lord. Would you like to stand if able for our next hymn, which is not in our hymn books, is that correct? Yes. It is, this one is in the hymn books. 875. 875, apologies, it's one of the other ones that's not in the hymn book. <laughs> We'll find out which one later. Uh, number 875 if you're using the hymn book. Your love 
preached in John's Gospel, Gospel chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon, soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if you worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterwards he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers, so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed four or five kilometres when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. They were terrified. But he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. May God be in my speaking. May God be in our listening. May God be in our hearts this day and evermore. Amen. Would you like to take a seat? I have forgotten how annoying it is to try and lead a service with a mask. It's been a while. It is really nice that I'm steadily getting to know people. I'm, I'm, in, I'm at the end of week two, so it still feels very new, but I reckon there are at least 10 people now that I can talk to and say your names and be confident I've got the name right. And so far no one's corrected me, which either means I'm doing well or you're very polite. So I feel like that's progress, I'm into double figures. And it's quite nice as well because steadily people are getting to know me and getting to know uh, my quirks and my foibles. I like the fact quite a lot of people have spoken to me about my love of the Beatles. That's something that's obviously got out there, which is good. Uh, best band ever. And it's one of those nice things as you get to know each other and, and uh, we build up that relationship. And I am a huge Beatles fan. It was really lovely that on my licensing service, uh, the cake, there was a picture in the Canal Side News today with the, with the picture of the cake, uh, which had the long and winding road, the A361 on it. 
Um, and that's a road, a long and winding road I'm definitely getting used to. I, a couple of years ago, I read Paul McCartney's book, The Lyrics, where he goes through quite a lot of the lyrics to uh, some of his best known songs and talks about how he wrote the song or the inspiration behind them. And there was one bit I thought was really interesting because he talks about the point in the mid-1960s when the Beatles got very involved in Eastern spirituality and Eastern religion. And writing about it, McCartney says, we were all very spiritual already. We'd grown up with Christianity, but didn't have much interest in it. We'd heard the stories of Jesus, but that was all quite boring. And I thought, that to me seems like one of the greatest condemnations of the church of the 20th century. We made Jesus boring. We allowed Jesus to become boring. When I encounter Jesus, when I read the Gospels, or when I read about Jesus, he was a lot of things, but he definitely wasn't boring. I think we can say that with some confidence. And one of the things I often think when, I, when I'm looking at why I think Jesus isn't boring is that I worry, as a church, we've lost our grip on Jesus as someone who is radical and political. And this ties in, if you were at St Mary's last week, you would have heard me talking about making Jesus known, because that's the Diocese of Salisbury's strategy at the moment, of making Jesus known. And what our question needs to be then is, who will we say Jesus is? If we're making Jesus known, who are we saying that he is? And that's why I would like to talk about Jesus as someone not only who demonstrated love, not only as someone who comes to us offering the love of God, but as someone who was radical and political. And when I say that, sometimes I say that and people have a picture in their minds, you know, we've just had a general election recently and, and we have an idea of what a political person looks like. And I'm not talking about that image we might have of a political person in our time and place. Jesus was very interested and very active about the way the world is run, about how the world is and how it should be. Because Jesus was pointing out that there are a lot of problems and actually we should be doing better in addressing those problems. So he was very vocal in his criticism of the elders and the leaders and the, the authorities of his time because they weren't doing what they should be. They weren't living up to what God had commanded them to do. And Jesus talked about the kingdom of God because he was saying, this is the way the world should be. The way the world, the way God wants the world to be. And this is now breaking in, both in the ministry of Jesus and in the world that is to come at some future date. Jesus was saying, this is how the world ought to be, not the way it is at the moment. And he also was clever enough to know that if he went around challenging the authorities and the powers that be, it would get him in trouble. If he went around saying, I am the Messiah, that was likely to end badly. And of course, in the end, it did end with his execution. But Jesus, Jesus was also clever enough to know to take the time to build up the movement before he moved into the open. And so what he often did was talked in code, and he told parables, and he talked in actions. And his actions demonstrated something about him that he wanted people to understand. If you were tuned in to what was going on, you would hear what Jesus was saying through his actions. And one of those key actions is the feeding of the 5,000, which interestingly is the only miracle story in all four Gospels, unless you count the resurrection, which was a miracle as well. But I think it's fairly key that that's in all four. But if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will read the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This story was important to all four writers because it says something about Jesus. 
And the version that we heard this morning is John's version of the story. And in this version, John doesn't talk about miracles. He doesn't use that word in his gospel. Instead, he uses the word signs. What Jesus did was a sign that pointed to something else. So if we read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, what is it a sign towards? What is it pointing us to? And for a Jewish audience, for an audience of, of Jews in the first century, it would have been inevitable that they'd connect a story of divine feeding, Jesus taking bread, sharing it, and feeding 5,000 people miraculously, or more than 5,000, as we're told. There were about 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Everyone ate, everyone had their fill. Divine feeding with this heavenly bread. And the story that would bring to mind would be the story of the manna in the wilderness. And many of you will know this story. The Israelites had left Egypt, they'd come out of the slavery of Egypt and were in the wilderness, travelling towards the promised land. But they were starving. And they said to Moses, why have you brought us out of Egypt only to starve in the desert? And Moses prayed to God, and God sent down manna from heaven, bread that literally fell out of the sky. And everyone ate, and everyone had enough, and no one had more than enough. Divine feeding. If we tell a story about bread shared divinely, God acting to feed the people in a miraculous way, it immediately connects into that story. And it seems like what Jesus is doing with this sign is he is taking the story of Israel and retelling it with himself at the centre. Instead of Moses as the prophet who prays to God, now we have Jesus as the prophet. In fact, more than that, now rather than God feeding the people, it is Jesus himself who does so. Jesus retells this key story of Israel, but makes it about himself and about the movement following him. It's a political act. He's saying, this movement that is following me, this is the true Israel, because the leaders in Israel have gone wrong and have failed. And it's worth following the story through to the second half. There's a key bit that joins the two, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, and the second part of the story about walking on water, and they're connected by this line. They wanted to make him king. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away. The people have tuned in. I said, if you were listening, you could catch what Jesus was saying in the action. They've tuned in, they've heard the message. Here is the one God has sent to be the true leader of Israel, and they want to make him king. But Jesus knows it's too soon. Jesus knows what will happen if they make him king. Immediately, the Romans and the Jewish elders and the Herodians, they will stamp on anything that they think threatens their power. So Jesus slips away because he's not ready for that action yet. Having rejected kingship at this point though, we then have a story where Jesus walks on the water across the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias as it's also called, and follows the disciples in their boat. Now, if you read your Old Testament, you won't find any stories of the Israelite nation going to sea. They didn't live in cities by the sea and build boats and go out on the waters because they hated the sea. It was the symbol of chaos. It was the thing that cannot be controlled. Even when we do get stories about it, it is about individuals like Jonah who went to sea fleeing God's word but God stirred up the oceans, sent a storm, and that was the divine action that showed Jonah was on the wrong track. Only God has power over the seas. It is the ultimate symbol of chaos for humans. And yet here is Jesus walking on the water. Jesus has power over the seas. Jesus has controlled the uncontrollable elements. There is only one explanation. God is fully present here. God is fully present 
with Jesus and what he is doing, because only God has power over the sea. So we have a story where Jesus is retelling the Israelite story, but making it about him and about his movement. And then is retelling the story of God, where Jesus is the one with power over chaos. If we're listening, we tune in to what Jesus is saying. And it's really, really interesting to me that our readings today have been thrown up together because we have a story where Jesus is revealing himself as an authority, as a power, as a leader, as the true authority in Israel. And we are contrasting that with the story of David and Bathsheba in the Old Testament. A story in which David, the great king, David was the king all other kings had to try and be like. He was the one they were always looking back to. He was the one that the people of Israel were always saying, we need a new king like David. He was the one who was described as beloved by God. And here we have a story of him really, really messing up. In fact, I don't know if you picked up on it, the first verse is really interesting. In the spring of the year when the kings normally go to war, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. What should a king be doing according to the expectations of that time and place? The king leads the armies. And we know David was a mighty warrior and a very able commander of armies. Why is he in Jerusalem? Why has he sent his armies out and stayed behind? What that verse tells us is David is failing as a king because he's failing to do what a king is supposed to do. What are our standards for our leaders that we hold them and use to measure them as to whether or not they're living up to the role God has given them? And then, of course, the story goes on. David sees this beautiful woman and has her brought to the palace and has his way with her, and she becomes pregnant. David tries to get Uriah to sleep with his wife so that it will look like it's Uriah's baby. But it turns out Uriah is a good man when David is not. Uriah will not do what he knows to be wrong. How can he go home to his wife when the soldiers are out of war? And so he stays in the palace and won't go home. So eventually David takes another action and manipulates the battle so that Uriah will be killed. And here's the kicker, here's the bit that really feels like the kick in the teeth to me. He writes the order to Joab, the commander, to say, make sure your eyes at the front and then have everyone else pull back. And who does he get to carry that order to the front? He sends it with Uriah. He sends Uriah's death warrant with him. What a terrible action for a king to take. What a terrible abuse of the power God has given him. Jesus sets out that the powers in Israel have gone wrong, that the kingdom of God must break in, and that the movement is centred on him, and that this new kingdom will be greater than the old kingdom, because the human king went wrong, but the God king will not. As we make Jesus known, we have to make sure he's not boring. We have to show that he was a figure who was talking about where the world has gone wrong and how we make it better. Who was willing to challenge powers and authorities when they're clearly in the wrong, to talk about the things where people are getting things wrong and how things should be done, how God's kingdom should be built. And he was willing to do it as well, to feed the people, to provide for their needs to touch the untouchables and to bring love to those the society has rejected. As we build our communities, are we willing to do the same things? Are we willing to proclaim Jesus as someone who fights against the status quo? Are we willing to challenge the authorities in our time and place when we see that they are getting things wrong, whether it be the Rwanda policy that was inhumane and unjust, or maintaining the cap on the two-child child benefit rules, 
Are we willing to challenge things that we see that are wrong in our society? Because we are saying God's kingdom is, is breaking through and we proclaim Jesus at the centre of it. Amen. Let's take a moment to think about Jesus' provision of bread. Bread broken and blessed and shared amongst the people. And about the earthly kings who get things so badly wrong. And as we reflect on those things, I would invite you to stand if able as we declare our faith in God, in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit on Neil for our time of intercession. Let us pray that the leaders of all churches and of all denominations seek respect for each other and that recon reconciliation becomes possible. The Holy Spirit brought good news to all nations. There should be no obstacles if men persevere with honest intentions. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Let us pray for our country and government. Let us pray that we can all recognise that the trying times ahead are not any different to those in the past. And that with prayer and goodwill, we should succeed again. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Let us pray for the Hunter family. Only 12 days ago, we welcomed Chris, Sally, Mike and Sophie to our benefit family. Any move is not easy and has problems, so let us pray for strength for them as they settle in to absorb the needs and benefits of our four churches and schools. Let our warmth, love and anticipation be a guide to our future together. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray for our villages. Let us pray for our local councillors and staff, that they're all guided to improve our well-being and standards of life, that rivalries, party affiliation and petty jealousies are not preventing improvements. Let us pray to the Lord. 
Let us pray for those less blessed. Let us pray for those who live in the shadow of darkness or despair. For those who live with the hopelessness of shattered dreams and betrayed opportunities. And for those who live without hope and love. Though we have known hardship and pain, though life has not always turned out as we hope, let us recognise that God's all-embracing love endures forever. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Let us pray for the faithless. Let us pray for the many men and women who will live without hope, without their pure light in their lives. We pray for those who find it difficult to believe. Even the disciples struggled to believe all that they had seen and heard. Grant us the courage to live as witnesses to your resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord help us. Let us pray for our sick and ill. Loving God, we pray for all those recorded in today's newsletter and for those struggling with sickness, with despair in their lives, and for all others, not only to ourselves. And now, for a few private moments, reflect upon our own requests and intentions, whilst we pray for all the above, for ourselves, our families, our friends, and our neighbours. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray for all those who mourn at this time, especially Louise and Caroline, and all of Margaret Holbert's family. Let us pray to the Lord. Merciful Lord, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand ready to share the peace. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So let's offer one another a sign of God's peace. And peace to you at home as well. We'll continue our worship by singing our next hymn, number 374, if you're using the orange books, Just As I Am.
Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you and of your own to be given. The Lord is here. Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Please be seated. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born as a, of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. When the night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Except through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us with, by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power 
be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, and mercy of God. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink is that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and read in me, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I confess it. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for us. For those both here and at home who have not been able to receive today, we say together the prayer of spiritual communion. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne me. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart, O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother. May I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And our post-communion collect for this week. Holy Father, who gathered us here around the table of your Son, to share the meal with the household of God in the new world where you reveal your fullness of your peace. Gather people of every race and language to share the eternal banquet of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we stand to sing our final hymn, and this is the one that isn't in the orange books. Bless the Lord, O oh, I knew there was one. So there was definitely one. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sin like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. The new edition of the Pew Sheet is out at the moment. Those of you, apologies to those of you who received paper copies. Michael is one of the ones who's unfortunately been suffering with COVID, and so the distribution of the paper copies has been delayed. They will be going out in the next few days. One very quick notice about this afternoon. Normally we would have tea at the Tim today. Unfortunately, yesterday I had to make a decision. My voice was not, at, not as anywhere near as strong as it is now yesterday. I, had, I virtually had no voice whatsoever. And so I had to make a decision to cancel Tea at the Tin. My apologies to anyone who was planning to come along today. 
There will be midweek communion this week here at 10 o'clock. And on Thursday, our PCC will be meeting. This is a meeting that was postponed from last week. Next Sunday, our services will be at St Mary Magdalene at 10.30. That's the Tin Church in Horse Road, for anyone who's not aware. And at 3 o'clock at Wadden. That's a beer book of common prayer service. And apologies, but I regret there is no coffee this morning for obvious reasons. And so we come to our final blessing. You may wish to stand once more. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and with those for whom you love, those for whom you pray, and remain with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.